let's stand and sing our first hymn, which is, See What a Morning, Gloriously Bright. And um, then we, we sing about our, our salvation. It says, Death is dead, love is won, Christ is conquered. So let's stand and sing. <laughs> And we're going to continue our series in John's Gospel now. Um, now, before I read the passage, and the PowerPoint should come up as well, let me just pray, commit this time to the Lord before we go on to look at uh, John's Gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for all those words we just sang. Uh, that death is dead, love has won, Christ has conquered. And Lord, we commit this time to you. Uh, we thank and praise you for the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we thank you that on the darkness of that day, Come Easter Sunday, that he rose again in glorious light. We thank you for light's triumph over darkness. Um, we thank you. That's the end of the story. As bleak as things may seem now, we thank you that darkness does not win. And thank you that Jesus is coming back soon. And so, Lord, we pray that we would take this time seriously and that we would repent and believe and trust in you. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said the PowerPoint uh, should come up, and if I just, obviously last week we looked at verses 1 and 2 of John's Gospel, and we looked at this being called the Word. Now if I just said, you know, Word, capital W, um, you're likely to perhaps think of a computer publishing program or something like that, Microsoft Word. If you ask the regular person on the street, um, tell me what you think of Word. Uh, they might make some reference to, um, to Bill Gates or to Windows. They'll tell you their opinion on the, the font Times New Roman or something like that. But as a church, and if you're a Christian, there's so much more to this word, word, than Microsoft Word, isn't it? A couple of weeks ago, we started John's Gospel, and we said that this Greek word is, um, is logos, word. And we heard last week, we heard that the word is not something. The word is someone. God himself. Now, so for many of us here, we're quite probably 
for lots of us here, we're probably quite familiar with these verses. Maybe we have them memorized. We know that the Word was with God, the Word was God. We know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's kind of that familiar rhythm, isn't there? But as we saw, there's a whole lot of theology and glorious things encapsulated in this one phrase, the words. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we're, um, we, we started at two verses, we're speeding up considerably tonight, we're doing three verses, catching Tim up on his series in Isaiah. But um, let's start, let's get to, and to set it in context, let's read those few verses there, verses one to five, and the words should appear on the screen as well. So John chapter one, verse one to five. In the beginning was the words, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we're going to dive in deeper now to who this word is. A couple of weeks ago we talked about who the word is. The word was God, the word is God. This evening, what I want to talk about is what the Word does. We looked at who he is tonight, what the Word does. And we're going to be looking at three things about this Word. The three points are the Word reveals, the Word creates, and the Word saves. That's where we're going. So firstly, the Word reveals. As we said, we saw, didn't we, that the Word was God, the Word was with God in verses 1 and 2. But what's implied in those verses as well is that the Word reveals who God is. And so in many ways, throughout the next 21 chapters of John, John's gospel is going to flesh out, to literally flesh out who God is in the person and work of Jesus. When you see Jesus working, you're seeing God himself working. And so this is not so much John telling us Jesus' story. It's in a book that Jesus is telling us the story of God. God is everywhere throughout this book. When we follow Jesus and we see him uh, him, him, him in walking and talking, we're seeing God in the face of Jesus. The Word reveals God. But we looked at a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, that the Word is not just another name for God. You know, we've got lots of names for God, like Father, King, but it's not just another name for God. We see there was a Word, the Word was with God. Remember, the first readers of John's Gospel were most likely uh, Jews who were fiercely monothe- monotheistic, one God's. Um, And for the Jews, they were living in a pagan, polytheistic world. And so they were fiercely monotheistic. Uh, The only people around them, and and they were saying that there was one God, not all these gods, not that God, not goddesses, and there's one God. They said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And now suddenly, John's telling us that there's also this other being called the Word. And then we see the Trinity, and this is what we're saying. John's not saying that the Trinity are three different gods, but there's one God. And this is the mystery of the incarnation and, and the Trinity. But the word reveals. What, what, what do words do in general? What do words do? What does speech do? I mean, when we talk, we reveal something about ourselves, don't we? Um, sometimes in the, in the news, if there's that news article, perhaps if it's a sensitive issue, um, maybe sometimes their faces are blurred out and their voice is um, uh, distorted, isn't it? Um, it's to keep everything confidential. But they're still communicating, aren't they? They're still revealing something about themselves. And how do you get to know someone better? Do you get to know someone better by just seeing them or hearing them? I mean, if you just stared at someone for a really, really long time, first you'd be a bit weird and creepy, but if you just stared at them and they just looked and they smiled, or you just stared at them and they don't smile like when you sit here in church, you're allowed to smile in church, but if you just stared at someone for a really long time, um, you wouldn't get to know them more. Would you get to know someone's true identity by just looking or with hearing? Have them talk to you, have them speak to you. Uh, when Nicola, my, my wife, when Nicola and my wife and I, um, we started dating, I was down in the depths and darkness in, in, in Newport, and then you saved me by bringing me to wonderful Newtown. But she, she was in, living in Ballot, and there was a bit of a distance there between us. So how do we get to know each other more by not being physically in the same place? 
Yes, we could use FaceTime and see each other, but we had words. We could text each other. We could phone each other. If we lived in another generation, some of you young ones might not know of this, but one of the ways you could communicate was by writing letters. It was bizarre. It would take days to get there, and then you would take days to, get, to send the letter back. But we got to know each other. We got to know, didn't see one another, but what did we have? We had words. We had speech. And what we're seeing here in John chapter 1, but throughout his gospel, is God revealing himself, the word revealing God. The word's not revealing something, the word is revealing someone, God himself. And so the, the word, capital W, is not just telling us interesting facts about God, it's showing us what God is like, revealing God himself. And sometimes we might get some, I guess, well-meaning, but some... I guess, naive Christians who say things perhaps sounding very spiritual, but they say, oh, you, you Christians, you Bible-believing, evangelical Christians, um, you're all about the Bible. I'm more about Jesus. You, know, you focus so much on the Bible, I, I want to focus on Jesus. And that is utter nonsense. All of it. Don't fall into that trap. Because the reason why the, the Son of God is called the Word is because he's revealing to us God, there's a reason why this book is called The Word, because all of this, Genesis to Revelation, it's God speaking to you. Now, obviously, this is not to Jesus. This did not die on the cross for your sins. And yet, this does reveal everything that Jesus has done for you on the cross. If you're a note taker, write this bit down. If you're a note taker, with this, we see you cannot separate redemption from revelation. And you can't separate revelation from redemption. And so the word reveals to us who God is. Secondly, you see, the word creates. The word creates. So look at those staggering words there in verse 3. Through him all things were made. Now, if I were to give you a theological test about uh, what things in creation, what things do we see um, that was made apart from the word, apart from Jesus, can you name something? I hope you can't, because it says there, all things were made by him. Now, of course, we, we live on the other side of the fall, and things are not the way they're supposed to be. And so we do see things like sadness, sickness, and sin. That everything in creation, created good, was created through the word, through Jesus. We might think, well, where do we see the word creating? Where do we see that? And well, it's there right at the very beginning of Genesis, isn't it? We might have missed it because it's so obvious, but what does God do to create? He speaks. He uses words. The word created. He, he said, let there be light, and what happens? There was light. Again, verse 3, without him, nothing was made that had been made. Now, we've had harvest recently, so we're kind of well-placed to talk about this, but we can look at creation. The sun, the moon, the stars were made by the word, the mountains, the lakes, the, sea, the, the seas, the oceans, uh, the grains of sand, all made by the word. You may remember a few years ago, I think it did the, the rounds in the news, the work, scientists were trying to work out, are there more stars in the universe or are there more grains of sand on our planet? And it wasn't just someone looking up at the night sky going, one, two, three, or just some poor scientist trying to count grains of sand. There was, I trust their science behind it, but it got a bit complicated. But they concluded, yes, there are far more stars in the universe than grains of sand on Earth. I actually looked it up on my phone earlier, as well, actually. It said, um, it says astronomers estimate there, are, there exist roughly 10,000 stars for each grain of sand on Earth. Isn't that crazy? But they had all the equations and, and formulas of what they could see through the Hubble telescope. But when you th think about sands, if you've been to the beach at all this summer, you've probably still got sand somewhere between your toes. But there are more stars. And then we hear in Isaiah that he knows each one by name. And all the animals that we see, we've got some great wildlife around us. Uh, red kites, if you go down to the river, you might be lucky enough to see a kingfisher, all made in a wonderful way, all made by the words. And sometimes people say, don't they, how can you Christians believe in the exclusivity 
of Christ. How can you believe that Jesus is the only way? When you see verses like this, how can we not believe that? How can we not believe that all things made through the words? Some people say, believe whatever religion you want. Take out whatever path you want to take. We're all different paths up the same mountain. No, we know the one who made the mountain. There is only one way. There is only one God. Verse 4, in him was life. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And notice it says there, we have life in him, in verse 4, in him. And so if you have life this evening, which a few of you seem to have this evening, if you have life this evening, you are a debtor. You are in debt to this word. You are in debt to Jesus. You might not feel like it. You might not be interested. You might not even care. But the Bible says you are a debtor to this word because you only have life tonight because of him. And only in him, trusting him, is there eternal life for you. Everything that's been made has been made by the word. The trees were good. The animals were good. The sun, the moon, even the sand, good, made by the word. We read a wonderful verse in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It should come up on the screen. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Again, from that verse, Jesus reveals God, the exact representation of his being. But also it says there, sustaining things, all things, by his powerful word. This, this ceiling with all the steel beams and whatever else, that's the limit of my architectural knowledge. But this ceiling doesn't collapse because God is upholding it right now with his powerful words. You might be like, well, no, there's laws of physics. Well, there are only laws because God's upholding those laws. Simply, without fail, whatever you think of Jesus this evening, you can be sure that your view of Jesus is too small, and so is mine. If we begin to just think, not only as what everything that God has done for us, but everything he's continuing to do, sustaining everything, upholding everything, we realise, when we think about this long, um, longer, we realise we are in no danger of ever thinking too highly about Jesus. This word. The word reveals, the word creates. Finally, the word saves. Look down at verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If you think of an eclipse, there's a man who works for NASA called Alex Young, and he says even where 99% of the sun is blocked out by the moon, the amount of light is still 10,000 times stronger than a full moon. Even when there's 1% of visible sun, it's still too bright to look at. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Only 1% of sun, and it's still like the, the light wind still. Um, I'm sure you know what it's like, perhaps a film coming out or a TV series, and you really wanna, um, you really, you're really excited to see it. You try not to read too much um, about it because you don't want to get a spoiler and ruin it. So maybe your friends or your family see the film, and you kind of want to tape their mouth saying, no, don't ruin it for me, I want to see it myself. Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert for the story that you're living in the future that's in store for us, for every single one of us. Here's the spoiler, and I hope you want to hear it. The darkness does not win. The darkness doesn't win. That's it. Darkness here for John, um, he's, when he speaks about this darkness, he's speaking about the fallen world of, of sin and Satan, the world that, because of our sin, has cut us off from God's, the world in rebellion against God's. The darkness does not win, John's saying. And, and, I, and I know that's hard to believe sometimes, isn't it? It seems like every week there's another act of terrorism, uh, another mass shooting, there's genocide in another area of the world, there's violence protests, even war happening. Perhaps some of you right now personally can think back at the the last year and think of a loved one who's died. You can think of that diagnosis that a person's had for cancer. We see sexual abuse, sick kids, even... In news articles, it seems every week we can hear about hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes. We know people who are gripped by addiction, experiencing chronic pain, people just stuck in depression. Perhaps you can look at your own life, and even now you know you're experiencing hurts, pain, and perhaps lots of that is going on behind the scenes that people don't even know. 
And then we look at the church around the globe that is hurting because Christians facing persecution, Christians being beheaded, being forced to leave their homes. It is hard for us, isn't it, not to become discouraged and feel despair. And yet the spoiler is true. Brothers and sisters, the darkness doesn't win. And this theme of light and darkness, it's, um, it's common, isn't it? It's common in the ancient day. Um, it's common today. It's used in sto- stories like Star Wars has got the light side and the dark side. Um, people talk about this get light against darkness theme, but John here, he, he's realistic. There is darkness. We don't need to pretend that's not the case. And he says, in the end, the darkness will not win. That, light, that long fight between light and darkness, the light is going to win even if it doesn't always feel like that. Perhaps if you're into uh, football, this will help you. But um, just think, how often does it feel? Life, it kind of feels like we're in injury time and we're goal down. And you get those games and where you follow your team, but when you win like that, you end up winning 2-1 in injury time. Don't you love to go back over the games and watch them again? You go onto YouTube, you watch Match of the Day, you see the highlights, and you can say to someone, you can say, Look, this is where we concede the goal. Uh, This is where our player gets a yellow card. This is where that player goes off injured. I know from looking at it here, it doesn't look like it, but we won. They did win. And we know the end of our story. We know how things are going to turn out. And so when you go through those deep valleys in life, and we do go through them, remember in the midst of that darkness in the valley, remember that's not the end. Light will not be overcome by darkness. That word there in verse 5, overcome. Maybe in your translations, some of the older translations uh, translate that as understand. The darkness doesn't understand the light. And maybe a good way to translate it would be master, to master it. that The light cannot be mastered by the darkness. Darkness doesn't have the authority. Light does. Light's more powerful. And so, brothers and sisters, in a, in a, in a A dark world that seems to be getting darker. Genders under attack, marriage under attack, Christians generally ridiculed. In that environment, in school, at work, don't be surprised if, because you have the light of the gospel, don't be surprised if you stand out and look odd in that environment. In fact, it's going to get increasingly worse for you as things seem to get darker. But light is more powerful. Perhaps... In, at home, maybe you're the sort of person that can't really sleep if there's too, too light in your room. You can try and get out blackout blinds, make the room as dark as possible, but even if there's a little light, it's powerful, isn't it? Perhaps there's something on charge in the middle of your room and you could see the light there. Even when you have a room of 99% darkness, a little light is powerful. And, it, the, and the darker it is in the room, the brighter that light seems to be. Light is powerful. I remember caving once in South Wales, and I absolutely hated it. Why on earth would you want to go caving? Um, it just felt claustrophobic. But anyway, the man leading our group, um, when we got to one area of the cave system, um, he told us to turn off our head torches. Now, I don't know why we did it, but you know, we might think that nighttime, perhaps we're in a dark room, we can still see some kind of light, can't we? We can see the outline of things, maybe it's a street light or something like that. But when we turned off our head torches in the cave, I have never seen darkness like it. Yeah, because there was no natural light at all, you literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And then without telling us, he turned his head torch on again, and it was absolutely blinding. Just a little light transformed everything. Light is powerful. And brothers and sisters, as dark, thing, as, dark as things may seem, the light does win. Jesus wins. And I'm not give, saying this to kind of give you a motivational pep talk that everything is going to be right in the end kind of thing. But why can we be confident that darkness does not win? Because this is not mere nostalgia. It's not because, because dreams come true when you really believe. It's not because we believe in the power of positive thinking. No, our confidence, our hope is rooted in history. Our faith is based on facts. And so we do not believe in the triumph of the human spirit. We don't believe in the power of positive thinking. We believe in a baby boy born in a mess in Bethlehem. As you look at that manger scene, think, 
light shines in the darkness. That happened. That really did happen. Real prophets foretold of a real virgin who would really give birth to a real baby boy. And he lived, he died, he rose again, and he is coming back again. Jesus, this light of the world. See, he was hated, wasn't he? We look at his life. He was hated. His, his closest friends deserted him. He was, in, he was in darkness when the sun stopped shining at the cross. And yet, the darkness didn't win. It seemed like it. Imagine how the disciples felt on that Saturday. Jesus died on the Friday. Imagine how they felt on the Saturday. They thought, oh, we were wrong about Jesus. Maybe the miracles were a fluke. Maybe there's nothing to this. And maybe some of you are thinking that tonight. Thinking, can I really trust this guy? Can I really trust this God? Maybe for you at the moment, life kind of feels like that Easter Saturday, that between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Maybe you feel like that. But come Sunday morning, there was no doubt that the light wins. Darkness defeated. So we sang, death is dead, love is won, Christ is conquered. Brothers and sisters, if, if God can create light with just a word, just speaking into in the midst of a universe of darkness, why do you not think he can transform your life? Light has come. And the question is for you tonight, what are you going to do with that light, this Jesus? It's would say later on in John's Gospel, Jesus would say, John chapter 8, 12, I am the light of the world. The question is, what are you going to do with this light, this Jesus? Because you've all been introduced to this, this light tonight. You're here in church this evening. Church is a great place to be. But it might surprise you to hear, church is always a, or also a very dangerous place to be. Because each of you will be held to account for what you know about this light, this word, this Jesus. So what will you do with Jesus? You may say nothing. You might think it's all rubbish. But mark this very well. The darkness doesn't win. And so tonight, repent, turn to him, believe him, trust him, obey him, and worship him. Words, the word reveals, the word creates, the word saves, and the darkness does not win. Amen. Before I hand over to Dan to lead us for a time of open worship and then the Lord's Supper, uh, let's sing a uh, an epic old hymn, or older hymn, um, Shine, Jesus, Shine. So, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>